<laughs> so you know they, uh, they make tools, right? Yeah, so they make like inserts and kind of crap like that, but they have like those high speed windows and stuff like that. Yeah. All right, so uh, what does it take? What does it take to get a piece of candy today? Yeah. No. Soul pledge. Soul pledge? Yeah. What's that? I've got to pledge my soul to you. <laughs> Pretty sure that's the first time it's ever been offered in class, and I and, and I think we should keep that on the DL. <laughs> um, <laughs> sweet. Um, no, nope, that's not it either. No, you don't get a piece of candy for raising your hand. And there's something else. Yeah, there's one more. There's one more step besides. I mean, the raise your hand, if you shout out the answer and you're correct, I'm likely to throw candy at you, um, as long as I can tell who it was. What's the, what's the last thing? I have to believe that the question was important. So first day, you just had to answer a question, because I just wanted people to participate. You know how lame it is to sit up here and ask a question of the class, a question you think the class should know the answer to? And have them just sit there. So I believe that for the most part, you guys don't care about today's lecture topic. In like the grand scheme of your life. I believe that. And I was lamenting on that this morning and one of my colleagues says to me, he says, well, what do you remember from when you were in college? And so I started thinking about it. And I've thought about this before. But um, so I remember actually Chris Brown, who I co-teach this class with. I had him as a professor when I was a student here. And, and so I remember a lecture with Chris Brown in ME2820. And he had a piece of ceramic tank armor. So you know how ceramic tank armor works? Anybody? The Army ROTC guy? There's an ROTC guy, right? Was that Army? Somebody was sitting over here last time I asked this question, though. So the way ceramic tank armor works is the projectile hits the tank. The ceramic tile that it hits explodes and absorbs the energy. It takes the energy away from the tank instead of letting it penetrate into the tank. Because right, we can't damage the tank unless we do work on it. Right? OK. So he had a piece of ceramic tank armor. And so he was telling us the story about the piece of ceramic tank armor because he didn't have it anymore. And he was saying, I had this class a few years ago and I had this piece of ceramic tank armor and I passed it around to the class and I said, be careful, you can break this. And the class took that as permission to break his piece of ceramic tank armor. So I remember that from when I was a student in college. I remember a story by one of my ECE professors and I I think I remember which professor it was, but I'm not going to say the name because he still works here and it might not have been him. But I remember when he told me that, or he told the class, not just me. He, he said that, you know, do you guys know what a payphone was? Yeah. It, it, who's used a payphone? Okay, so we haven't gotten away from the payphone generation entirely. He could whistle the tone that made the payphone give you free calls. So, I mean, you could buy whistles that would whistle the tone. Actually, I think it was like the in the Captain Crunch book, or uh, like Serial Whistle. That would actually be the right tone to get free calls on payphones. People figured that out. What do you do? Sit all day in the payphone and like, <laughs> nope, <laughs> nope, <laughs> right? Can't you just, I mean, and it was like a nickel then for a call. Um, so I remember that story. And I remember Bob Norton, who, who retired a couple years ago. And there were several stories from Bob Norton. Um, but they all had to do with him driving a car. Which I suppose the class was like design of machine elements, where one of the things we did was figure out how to do the math to balance a V8 engine. So I suppose it was related 
to the, by the way, V12 is the easiest to balance of, of those engines. If you can't get a V12, get a straight six. If you want it to be smooth and not rough running and stuff like that. Or they get to put all these balancing things in there. Anyway, anyway that's what I remember from Bob Norton's class. So I suppose it's okay that you guys don't care about today's lecture topic. As long as you learn enough to pass the quiz, right? And as long as, so, so it, it, I actually, I, I believe this is true because you don't have to remember all the details. You don't have to remember all the math because why don't you have to remember the math? Engineers never work without a book. You guys are mostly gonna be engineers when you grow up, right? Right? Engineers always look up the answer. What, what do you do before you try to look up the answer as an engineer? So it's just think, I mean, I, I'm telling you, it's okay to look up the answer. Before you even try to look up the answer, what do you do first? Yeah, Gus. I mean, you gotta understand the question, which is why I say that engineering is, engineering is like a bunch of word problems, right? I said that at the beginning of the class. So, so you have to understand the question, absolutely. Once you understand the question, and you're like, oh, shit, there was a book. I mean, right now you could Google, right? Google is likely to point you towards the book. But, but even before you Google, what do you do as an engineer? Anybody? You're, you're all, who is an engineer right now? Who plans to be an engineer? All right, now when I say who is an engineer right now, keep your hands up. You're already an engineer, you just don't have all the training yet. Would you believe that? If you plan to be an engineer, you are an engineer. You just don't have all the training yet. So what's the first thing you do? All right, so you're working on a homework problem. I've told you that not only are you encouraged to collaborate when you work on these homeworks, these quizzes, but I actually want you to. Right? You're, I hate to say required to, because then if somebody just knows the answers and they write them down, then they're cheating. Well, that would be true, right? If you're required to collaborate and you don't, then you're cheating. But you're certainly encouraged to, and I wish I could require you to. What's the first thing you do when you don't know the answer? Say you're sitting at a table next to your group mates. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ask them. Hey, dude, where's the answer to this question? Right? First thing you should do as an engineer, if you know you know somebody that knows the answer, Call them and ask them at least which book to look in, right? In order to do that, though, you have to be able to understand the problem, and you have to have some you have to have some means in your mind to figure out and to understand what's possible and what's not possible, right? So when we try to violate laws of physics, that's bad. Unless we succeed, in which case it was kind of a theory of physics, not a law, wasn't it? Right? You know, the world was flat right up until it wasn't. Right? Right? You know, surfaces were Euclidean geometry right up until we realized they had roughness on them. Right? All surfaces you could describe with a Euclidean geometry, but you could also describe with a fractal because it's got roughness on top. Right? So, um, anyway, where are we? What are we doing here today? Power, force, and chips. I said we were going to finish up on orthogonal cutting systems, and then we were going to introduce stress and strain. Okay. What do we know about orthogonal force systems so far? What do we know about power, force, and chips so far? Where did we end up yesterday? We've got our, we've got our chip forming on the edge of the tool. Right? So, tell me something about this chip for me on the edge of the tool here. Somebody. Because I can wait. I mean, it is live video, and I hate dead air, but I can wait. Go ahead. It looks like the side edge cutting angle is uh, zero. I believe you know, the other one, we actually engraved that in the side. I have two of these. And yes, side edge cutting angle in this example, it does look like zero. According to the solid model, it was four degrees, which is pretty much zero, right? What's cosine of four degrees? Pretty much one. So for all intents and purposes, the side, side edge cutting angle was zero. Um, what else do you know? 
What's, why do we care about side edge cutting angle? Somebody else up in the back, red shirt. Why do I care about the side edge cutting angle? If you don't know the answer, nominate somebody else to answer. Quick, quick, quick. Lily. Side edge cutting angle. In some of my slides, I call it beta, but I was yelled at by Professor Brown. And since he was my PhD advisor, I have to listen to him when he yells at me. He says, other people who talk about chip formation use beta for something else. I have yet to find it in the literature, but he says that, so I've stopped using beta. When some of my slides, it still says that. So that's not right. What else you got? Somebody else. Back here. Um, the, was that, what symbol is that on your shirt there? What's the brand on that shirt? Under Armour. Under Armour guy. <laughs> what was the question? Back in the back corner. Why do we care about side edge cutting angle? What, what, say it louder, I didn't hear. So yes, chip formation, but that's the whole week. So I, I don't think that deserves candy. Chip size or like? T1? Chip size, what size? T1, right? T1 equals cosine side edge cutting angle. I really wish we just had a variable like beta for that. Times feed, right? Side edge cutting angle equals Cosine, or it's T1, right? Why do we care about T1? Yes. Oh, wait. Here you go. Oops. I think you knew the right answer. Say it again, though. Right, but why do we care about it? Give me that candy back. Why do we care about it? Why do I care about the uncut chip thickness? I, we've already established that you guys don't care, but it seems pretty clear that I do. So why do I care about it? Yes? No. I mean, it's related to feed, but sure, but no. Our end goal might be to find the cutting force. How does it bring us to find the cutting force? Yeah. You form a ratio with the cut chip thickness, right? And how do we know cut chip thickness quickly? Everybody, pick the damn chip off off the bottom of the machine, right? So T1 over T2 equals RT. So we can make a proportion. RT is related to what? On our diagram here, on our picture here. Should I draw the diagram? I bet you I got a slide of it that we can pull up. All right, it's on this slide. Is it weird that it flashes like that sometimes? It kind of freaks me out. Okay. So it's on, the, the thing that we care about is on this slide. The, the, un, the chip ratio lets us do. Yes? Angle. Yeah, but dude, you're pretty skinny. You keep eating all this candy, you're going to get fat. I know from experience. <laughs> all right, so, so this lets us figure out the shear angle. Anybody remember the equation? Tangent of the shear angle. Oops. Do that the wrong way. Tangent of our shear angle equals RT. Anybody shout it out? Cosine alpha. What's alpha again? Rake angle one minus RT sine of alpha. Right. So, and why do we care about the shear angle? It's even on the board. Cool. Why do we care about the shear angle? Why do I care about the shear angle? You're killing me up here. If you wanted to care about it, why would you care about the shear angle? Right. So as that chip forms, there's relative motion between the chip and the workpiece that's flowing by, right? And it's shearing at that plane where the shear plane happens. 
And if we can understand, if we can, if we can do something to make that shear plane smaller, that means the cut took less energy, right? And if the cut took less energy, that means our power consumption was down one, but power equals force times velocity. If the force goes down, what happens to the tool? It lasts longer, right? So this is cool stuff. All right. So power equals force times velocity. So on our, let me change this up here. Right, oh, close, reaching around everything. I want PC on the right projector. Did it do it? Yeah, sweet. All right, I'll put the document camera on the left projector. Yeah, no. PC. I finally understand how the control system works for this room. Okay, so power equals force times velocity. We got that, right? We, I meant to fix these slides a little bit before lecture, but instead I created, I started creating a whole new set of slides before lecture and that wasn't finished. So I have to go with last year's slides. So this is our cutting force, right? Our FC. FC is the force up here times velocity. Velocity, so I guess it's relative velocity. So the tool's moving this way, the workpiece is moving that way. Okay. FT is the force that keeps the tool pressed down against the workpiece. If we didn't have FT, if FT went to zero with this diagram, what would happen? This is worth a piece of candy. Just a Twix. Not for very long, but why? In, in this entire drawing, just forget that we know where P1 go, P goes. If FT goes to zero, what's going to happen? Could you guys draw a free body diagram of the chip? If you drew a free body diagram of the chip, you could do that, right? Physics one, right? Anybody in the class cannot draw a free body diagram of the chip. Nobody's willing to admit it. Another really funny story from class, something that I remember, but I was guest lecturing in the class. I wasn't actually a student in the class, but uh, there was a student in one of the back rows that asked a really stupid question. And the professors are not supposed to be judgmental when the students ask really stupid questions, are they? At least, it seems like it's uncool to be judgmental. I was the guest lecturer, the professor teaching the class was introducing me, but the student asked this really stupid question. And the professor had tenure, so they can pretty much do what they want. <coughs> he looked at the student and said, did you take physics one here? And the student said, yes. And the professor said, you should ask for your money back. <laughs> so that's another story I remember from a lecture. Got it. Uh, it was it, it was appropriate thought to have, perhaps, but not appropriate way to express it. Uh, where where were we? Oh, what's what's going to happen in this situation if there is no force pushing the tool in this direction? Yeah, the tool is going to accelerate away in that direction, right? So this force is required to keep us in steady state, to keep us from, there's no way I'm gonna throw a Twix bar in this room. The other room has a higher ceiling, you know that? Which is why the underhand throw works better there. I can lob it over there. All right, so we have to have this FT here, right? So we've got a force pushing down. Where's that come from? Pushing the tool down towards the workpiece, yeah. In this drawing, some of it could come from gravity. And I suppose, depending on the configuration of the machine tool, some of it might come from gravity, but no. Right. So the tool is fixtured in the machine. There's a motor that drives the axis that the tool is fixtured to. So the, the energy from the wall goes to the motor driver that's driving that servo motor to push the tool up against the workpiece. 
if that servo motor is underpowered, the uncut chip thickness is going to continue to get smaller until the tool is no longer pushing. Somebody over here said it's going to start rubbing. Yeah, th that's what you meant, right? Yeah. Um, OK, so that's going to happen. All right, so what else is interacting with that chip? Can we, can, we re can we just draw the chip here? I mean, I know we can. I might not be an artist, but I can do that much. So I got my tool, I got the chip. All right, so what's the direct, the chip's moving, is that correct? What's the direction of motion of the chip? Oh yeah, if I face this direction, it is like that. The ship's moving in that direction. It has velocity. Now, what's pressing on the chip? Right here, the cutting edge is pressing on the chip, right? And it's applying that. If only I could draw better. So there's definitely that cutting force pushing that direction on the chip from the cutting edge of the tool. You believe that? What else is pushing on the chip? And let's discount gravity. Okay, and we're assuming we're in steady state operation here. So we can discount, you know, it flickered again, didn't it? Is it weird that it flickers? Okay. Right, so that chip is sliding along the rake face of the tool. Right, it's sliding along the rake face of the tool, and there's friction between the chip and the rake face of the tool. So we've got to be able to line a force up with the friction plane. What else is happening to the chip? What else is acting on the chip? Yeah? Yeah. Oh, the friction gets a friction gets a snickers. You're the one I hit in the head before, aren't you? Yeah, you're in a bad spot. You had something. No? Oh, I thought you had your hand up. No, no, no. All right. Well, you're sitting right behind him. You must know what he was thinking. Yeah. What else is acting on the chip? Think about it. We're engineers. We can think. He's going to take a direct hit. The workpiece is pushing on the chip, right? The workpiece is moving in this direction. The chip is moving in that direction. The tool is moving in this direction. So is that workpiece, that workpiece has to slide down a little bit. It's trying to push the chip that way. Because that's where the cutting happens. That's where the shearing's happening, right? So we've got an angle that's aligned with the shear plane. What do we call that angle again? The shear angle. Man, we are inventive engineers. Shear angle. We've got an angle here of the tool with relative to straight up and down, right? That's our rake angle. That's the tool. Now, that friction lines up with that rake face, right? So, so there's an angle here that has to do with the direction of friction. Does that make sense? And, but, now wait a minute. If we draw a free body diagram, we should be able to reduce this to one force, right? One, one force in one moment, but we already, I already told you we're throwing the moments out. So one force in one moment, that's our resultant force. P. So we got a force, P. And you can divide any force up into two components that align with a, with a uh, plane, right? You can, you can put any force down onto a plane with two components. We call those orthogonal force systems. So we actually have three orthogonal force systems that can describe this cutting operation. And we can use any of those three. And if we know these angles, we can actually move from one force system to the other. That makes sense? It's all geometry at this point. So we've got our thrust force, FT. We've got our cutting force, 
FC, and those have to add together to make P, right? Our resultant force. Does that make sense to everybody? So what else do we have? And I, these are not the slides I intended to use today, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, we already looked at those. We already looked at this. All right, friction forces. So, I don't get it. Flickers a lot though, doesn't it? It is a classroom in Washburn in 223 where when the HVAC unit on the roof turns on, the whole thing does this. And so you'll be sitting in the classroom and the screen's doing this. <laughs> I think we, we must have some um, Americans with Disabilities, ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA violations here in these classrooms. Like the flickering light there, that's probably bad for people with epilepsy. I'm pretty sure the vibrating thing, that's just bad for everybody. <laughs> you don't have, all right. Anyway, I shouldn't say that on live video because now the, the police are going to come check out the campus. All right, friction coefficient. Um, what's friction coefficient do to us in all situations? What time is it, by the way? 30. 30, okay. Friction coefficient, what does it do for us? So frictional force is always in the opposite direction of motion, right? Yep. And... We know the magnitude of the frictional force possible in any situation if we know the friction coefficient and the normal force, right? The maximum friction force available in any situation equals the friction force times the normal force. Is that true? Did I just make that up or is it true? Okay, good. So there's this angle, the friction angle, which I hope shows up when I... No. All right, we'll skip over that for a second. Anyway, how do we know what mu is? Yeah, it actually gets a little bit harder. So in general situations, right, we could do this to figure out mu. And if we know the angle at which it started sliding, we can figure out our static friction coefficient. You guys all do that in physics? I did that in one of the Bob Norton classes. So uh, mechanics and machine elements, I did that. And he always gave these group assignments, and you had to design some mechanism that would do some function. And so we were designing a random orbit sander for our project the mechanism that would do the motion for it. And he always had this requirement for his projects. He said, you must have fun while completing this project. And he had this specific format for the reports for the projects. And so you had to list the requirements at the beginning of the report. And so we listed the requirements and we put the page number where we answered that requirement for the report. So it was sort of like a table of contents. And so for you must have fun, we said see Appendix B. Because we drank several pitchers of beer while figuring out the friction coefficient. Because we were all 21 and we could. <laughs> so, see Appendix B. Um, have fun while doing this assignment. Um, friction coefficient. So, here we actually have to get it from measuring the forces. Because what, what affects the friction coefficient on any surface? Yeah. The other surface that it's touching. The temperature in between those two surfaces. The bulk material properties and all that stuff. And the temperature is really high here. It's really hard to measure that friction coefficient without simply measuring these forces. Okay, but if we get, so F over N, so our friction force is the force that lines up with our friction plane. So that would be F. And N is the one that's perpendicular. So something like that. Very inventive. N is the normal force to the friction force. F over N equals tangent of the friction angle. And I don't want to write it here because it's either the angle between here and here or it's the angle between here and here, and I don't remember which one it is. It's on one of the other slides. Um, this guy Merchant was a very famous studier of this kind of stuff. You know when most of our advances in understanding chip formation happened? Anybody know? Historically, time frame. You might think early 1900s, and we started getting concerned about it in the early 1900s. But when did it really happen? 
it happened in the 1930s and 40s so that we could more quickly build bombs and airplanes and ships. We really needed to speed up our ability to do this manufacturing process. And so we did a lot of this work. And Merchant was working back then. Um, he was, I, I mentioned Chris Brown, Professor Brown. Merchant, if I recall correctly, was Professor Brown's PhD advisor's PhD advisor. So we're not that far removed. So I'm like four steps removed from Merchant as a PhD advisor. So, so he figured out that the shear angle equals that friction angle related to the, uh, the rake angle. And um, so 45 degrees tau over two plus alpha over two. And so if you could measure that friction force and, and normal force, you could figure out what that shear angle was, yeah, without having to do one of those high speed photography things. Um, half of tau. Tau is the friction angle. It, it shows up on one of these slides coming up here. It wasn't on the one I wanted to show it to you on. Um, and with geometry, you can actually, if you know all those angles, so if you know the friction angle, you know the rake angle, you know the shear angle, and how do you get the shear angle? You can calculate it if you know the uncut chip thickness and the chip thickness, right? So if you know those things, then you can transition from one of these four systems to another. And there's actually several of these slides with the equations and the drawings on them that I'm going to share with you guys, but we don't have to go through them one by one right now. What you, what you need to be able to do is know that these things are possible and then be able to locate the resource material to figure that out because that is your group assignment number two, is to be able to do this. And so for group assignment number two, we're going to present you with problems such as if the cutting force is this and the shear force and the shear force is this and the rake angle is this, calculate the normal force. That's not gonna be one of the problems, but, but stuff like that. We're gonna present you with problems like that with sample data so that you can build in a spreadsheet, use Excel. I mean, you can use Google Sheets, but Excel is gonna work better and we're going to ask you to hand in an Excel file. So if you use Google Sheets, you're gonna to have to download it as an Excel file when you're done um, because the way the Canvas grading system works, it's easy for us to see the Excel file that you hand in. And it's a pain in the butt if you try to link a Google Sheet to it. So we are gonna ask you to hand in an Excel file. Um, there are 10 questions. I believe we do the first one for you as an example. And there's a video example for what we want, what we want it to look like. But what I want you to do is to build computer models to solve common problems in doing this chip calculation stuff. So that when you do the final exam, you'll be able to use your computer program to answer all the questions that are on that topic. And there is not going to be a quiz on this topic other than you hand in your Excel file that you guys make together in your group. If anybody's still having group issues, if you had a group of people that didn't show up or didn't work with you and stuff like that, make sure you talk to Zhao Long about that and he will sort it out for you. Um, so we get a bunch of these things. Um, as a recent, apparently that's the last one in this presentation though, because it's not going anymore. Oh. But I've got a, um, I've got a whole uh, slideshow presentation of all of the equations that we use in the entire class including the ones that we've used before, like the profit rate one, the feed ones, the, the calculate speed from RPM, all those equations, all the equations and reference material here for this, and it's affectionately known as ME1800 equations. So I wait until after this lecture and then I turn that on for you guys. So it also contains all the equations that we're going to use in the future in the class. So you can use that as a reference when you're building your spreadsheet to solve these kinds of problems. Okay, what time is it now? 37. 37, okay. So that's enough on chip formation and geometry in orthogonal force systems and why I understand you don't care, but you have to know anyway. Let's talk about stress and strain. Who knows something about stress and strain? Who knows what stress is? Yes. Yeah, I was pointing. I thought you raised your hand. No? What's stress? Force, 
force on an object too much. What's what's engineering stress? Force or, or, yeah, stress. Force applied to an area. Right, so stress is force applied to an area. What does stress do to stuff? All right. She says stress makes you cry. What does stress do to stuff? Why would it break a tool? Yeah. So what stress always does is it does some sort of deformation. That deformation could lead to breaking the tool. Right? But stress always, and even if you can't see it, when I push on the bezel here on the, the computer monitor, something's being deformed. Now, in this case, it's probably the end of my finger, mostly. But I suppose, metaphysically, it probably was deforming the computer monitor a little bit, too. I don't know. Hard to measure. So force over area equals stress. What's strain? There's a whole class titled Stress and Strain here at WPI. Who's taking it? What's strain? You should have, wait, no. <laughs> what do you got? So we said stress always deforms an object. Strain is a measure of the deformation. So stress, and so in this case, in this case, we're pushing on our round thing with forces on both ends, right? And is F equal to F? Why? How do you know F is equal to F? Yes. Right, otherwise it would be accelerating. And it wouldn't stay on the screen. Right, it would be accelerating if the F's weren't equal. So we know F is equal to F. <coughs> so stress is that force applied to the area. What's the area in this case? It's written on the board. Yes, what's the area? You got it. Yeah, your hand was up, sort of. Yeah, what's pi r squared equal? Yeah. Pi r squared equals the area of the circle, the cross-sectional... Oh, man, that was a close one. <laughs> he woke up, though. Pi r squared is the cross-sectional area of the element being stressed. Being Yeah, being stressed. So strain is the result of stress. So length one, no stress. It's fancy animations, huh? I'm pretty proud of them. Length two... Length zero, no stress. Length one, stress. Strain is the difference divided by the initial. Now, what if the other one is the initial one? What if we were pulling instead of pushing? The math still works, right? Okay. All right, so that's stress and strain. Now, that's engineering stress and strain. Why they need to have an entire class about it here at WPI, I don't know. Because I can cover it in two lecture slides. Pretty sure there's more to it. Let's talk about stress and strain in general now. Right, what time is it? I got time. Stress and strain. What's the, what's the colloquial or the, um, what's the other word for colloquial? Common usage, what's the other word? Vernacular, Vernacular. maybe that's a good word. You guys talk about stress and strain all the time, right? Especially college students, especially as exams are approaching. Get, who had midterms this week in a class? Do you notice we didn't do midterms? I hate exams. Um, the, you know what they measure? If you're good at taking exams. I was good at taking exams, so I don't know why I hate them, but what is, what is stress? In your life, what is stress? Yeah, no, there's no difference. Same stuff, different word. The units for stress is the same as the units for pressure. 
Um, I guess it's stress when we want to do math about it and calculate strain. What is, uh, what's stress to you? Maybe have something stressful happen ever in life? Like, was it stressful when you were trying to figure out which college you got into and how much financial aid you got? What does that kind of stress do to you? Because it's the same as this. All right, it, it, things not going according to the plan can be stressful, not for everybody. Yeah. Right, it's some kind of pressure on you. And you, you said pressure, right? So pressure on us can give us stress. And how do you get rid of stress? So eat more. Right, people do that too, right? Yeah. <laughs> Med I, meditating is better than eating more. <laughs> right. <laughs> I. That's Photoshop. In case you're wondering, there's Photoshop involved. Right. <clears throat> so, um, so the other thing that we we talk about when we talk about stress and strain, especially in this class, is we talk about this relationship here of stress over strain and our elastic modulus. So the slope of this line, and so our our engineering stress, we plot that on the y-axis. And, and we plot our engineering strain on the x-axis of this plot, we can learn something about the material that we're stressing, right? And, and so when you do this, the slope of the line that you get when you plot the stress versus strain tells us our elastic modulus for, the, um, for that material that we're doing. And if we understand something about stress and strain, we understand that makes that material predictable to us, right? So what we're going to be talking about next week in class is we're going to be talking about fixturing in CNC machining. And, and so what do we mean when we say fixturing? Yes, Ian. Holding the, work. holding the workpiece, actually holding the tooling also is fixturing. So holding the tool, holding the workpiece, that's fixturing. And what does our fixture have to do in a machining operation? It has to withstand the cutting forces that we now know something about estimating and calculating, right? So we, we haven't done any of these math problems yet, right, for cutting forces. What do you guys think? What's your intuition tell you about what the cutting forces are in one of these operations? Scale ranges. Is it a couple pounds? Is it a couple tons? What's the scale for cutting forces in these operations? A couple hundred pounds? What do you guys think? Who thinks it's usually less than 10 tons in a CNC machining operation? Usually less than 10 tons? Who thinks it's usually more than 10 pounds? Now there's exceptions to all these, right? So it's somewhere between 10 tons and 10 pounds. What is that? A ton is 2,000 pounds? So we're within like two factors of 10 now? It's not too bad. It's, I mean, that's engineering guess, right? You do know what Sometime ask me about engineering judgment. And some other day ask me about why we have three rings in our uh, base. Whoever I told to ask me about why there's three rings in the base. Um, fixture. Oh, so we got to withstand forces. Hundreds to thousands of pounds of force. The servo motors that drive the axes in those Haas machines can deliver thousands of pounds of thrust to the tool. So the tool has to be able to withstand thousands of pounds of thrust in interacting with the workpiece. Um, in general, it tends to several hundreds of pounds of force to make those little small chips. If we make bigger chips, is there more force or less force? Bigger chips, more force. Smaller chips, less force. Um, did we say that if we apply a stress to something, it always deforms? Right. So how does deformation impact fixturing then? So we're going to talk about that beginning of next week. Um, if we squeeze something tight, then cut a hole in it, and then let go of it, what shape does the part come out? Things to consider for next week. Okay, so stress and strain, elastic modulus, 
here's a here's some examples and some math. We're gonna go over this in detail next week and stress and cutting. Okay. Um, dynamic shear stress. This one you'll need to know. So there's actually stress that happens inside the chip, right here at the at the shear plane. There's stress happening in there, and you'll be able to calculate that as dynamic shear stress. And there's some equations in the equations thing about how to calculate that stuff. So, all right, I will see you guys next week. Oh, hey, what's the requirement to get candy from here on out? I said it on the first day, but is anybody listening? It's a pretty important topic. You guys might have cared about how to get candy. You have to just want candy and come take some. Because I'm tired of throwing it. So anybody that wants some candy can come grab some before or after class. Till it's gone. Oh.